Okay, so I'm going first. I'm going to tell you about some techniques you can use to kind of help you answer your interview questions effectively. You might have come across this one. It's called the star interview technique. There's several, but this is probably the most well known one and it's quite succinct and to the point. So it can help you kind of get you the question the, the answers in your head when you hear the question from the interviewer. So next slide. Yeah, so it, invo it involves you thinking about the situation when you're describing a, um, an example to the interviewer, think about the situation you were in, the task you were given, what you actually did and the outcome. So four key things to think about um, and try and kind of sound these out before you go into the interview. Next slide. So quite often you will get, you can use the STAR um, technique when you get behavioural types of questions. And these are kind of questions when they say, tell me about a time when, what do you do when, describe a situation when, how did you go about, can you give me an example of. So quite often you're kind of on the spot trying to racking your brains thinking of things. But if you thought about it before you go in, think about the possible questions you could get and think about the start elements, this will go a long, a long way to helping you. Next slide. So there's some things to think about. So when you are kind of thinking about what you're going to say in the interview, and to a certain extent, you can kind of dictate what will happen in the interview because you'll have your situations in your head that you'll have thought of. So when you're doing this, think about the latest things that have gone on. Don't think about maybe really kind of old examples. Try and keep it quite recent and quite positive. And when you are thinking about it before you go in, define it as a situation, the task, the action, the result. And be honest, if you're put on the spot, you might end up kind of misinterpreting the truth or truth or lying a bit. But believe it or not, interviewers can tell. They've been in probably in a lot of interviews. They can start to tell when someone's not telling the exact truth. And as you know, if you tell one lie, quite often this can lead you further and further into other lies. So if possible, try and be honest. Give a positive image of yourself. So even something, if something did go wrong, you're describing that something went wrong. Say how you kind of righted it and made it made the situation better, and avoid generalising. So don't use the same example for multiple questions. They've got to be quite recent, and you've got to have quite a few in mind. Yep. So as I said with the kind of interview question that I don't like being asked, you don't necessarily have to talk about things that only happen in your work life. You can talk about things that happen outside of work, maybe a group you're volunteering in, um, a hobby, etc. because you might not be able to kind of leadership. I don't have a lot of things that I lead on in work. So it's very useful to think of kind of situations outside of work and keep your responses short and to the point. This just helps you to stop rambling and losing your thread. You'll be nervous, so you want to keep it quite short and succinct so you don't lose your thread. Keep it conversational, so you probably will have practiced what you're gonna say before you go in, but it has to have that appearance that it's not been practiced too much. So try and keep it conversational. If they're going to be, be prepared, they might ask you follow-up questions. So, you know, it's a good, good. Um, it's probably best not to kind of miss muddy the truth too much or lie in any way because it'll just get you in deeper and deeper. If you talk about something you know about, something that's actually happened to you, this will probably be a lot more successful. And kind of, as I said, have these stories in mind before you go into the interview. So, as I said, to a certain extent, you can dictate what is going to be said in the interview. You can't totally twist the questions, but you will have an idea of what they're going to ask after looking at the job description. And you can kind of predict what, what, what is going to be asked and what you could say to those possible questions. And another good thing is rehearse your answers in front of the mirror. So literally stand in front of the mirror. No one likes doing it, but especially if you've been asked to do a presentation or something, rehearse it in front of the mirror to see how you're coming across. Next slide. So this was, these are just kind of some of the things that I've been asked um, whilst I've been going for interviews and how I break it into kind of star. So I have the key points in my head and I can talk about it and not go off on a tangent. So I think one of the things was in our trust, there's a lot of health literacy problems, patients not understanding medical information, missing appointments. So my task was to introduce health literacy training to the, task, to the trust. I did this. I trained groups of doctors, nurses and physios 
and the result. If you can give them stats, this always works out well, that we've trained about 200 in individuals and have helped make the trust into a health literate friendly organisation. And if you can give stats and figures, it always goes down well. Next slide. So what experience do you bring to this post? So you will, that's quite a key question. You probably will get asked about this somewhere along the line. So you could talk about how you, uh, I would talk about how I do a lot of, a lot of research is taking place within the trust, especially due to COVID and during the, that COVID period and task. I'm an experienced searcher keen to improve my search and skills. So searches were given to me to carry out with. So action, I carried out in-depth searches and systematic review searches for clinicians and a result at one point or have I helped a doctor kind of create a protocol. Next slide. Can you give me an example of where you have managed change in difficult circumstances? So something like one of the difficult circumstances in our trust is they're always cutting back on money and we always we're always fighting kind of for our place. So we were trying to buy a new resource for nurses and we weren't getting very far. So I got advice to prevent my manager with key stats and KPIs that proved nurses would benefit from the resource. And the result is we did get clinical skis purchased for the nurses. Next slide. Can you give me an example of how you have dealt with a difficult member of staff? So situation we take on volunteers. One of the volunteers was not following instructions when completing tasks. He would do it, but when I went back and checked, I could see he hadn't followed the instructions clearly. So I set a task for him to do. I gave him the instructions in two ways. I emailed the instructions to the volunteer and I also gave him verbal instructions. I realised for some reason or other he's more of a visual learner. He likes to see me talking to him and he liked a demonstration. So I did this and the result has been we've carried on doing this and tasks get carried out to a better degree of accuracy. Next slide. So that was just about STAR. And when you're preparing, just put key points under each of the STAR elements. And hopefully when you go into the interview, you've got something to fall back on and you can develop it in more depth. So the next section is research in the organisation. So you'll be going for a job at an organisation somewhere. It could be within medicine or it could be outside of medicine. But it's going to stand you in long stead if you research the organisation and things that could influence the organisation. So if you were going for a job within the trust, within a trust or some sort of medical background, you probably want to look at knowledge for healthcare, and um, you'd want to look at the Million Decisions campaign, the Topol Review, um, the NHS England website. You might want to look at Royal College websites. You might be going for something outside of um, health, so you might want to be looking more at government websites, civil servants websites. So researching the organisation and possibly researching the panel members who are going to interview you and being aware of what's in the news, topical information that could have an outcome on the interview process and also keeping up with your information professional that's sent out by Philip Sillip monthly. I've talked about kind of maybe very library specific jobs, but you might find I do know librarians that have started working for organizations and they've tweaked their skills to match your organization so you might want to um, you know look in the Guardian jobs website and find organizations that would match your skills so it's just another option open to you next slide so as I said, research the organisation, the key executives, recent developments, service mix, its position in the market, research the interviewers or panel members that are coming along. But have it in the back of your mind quite clearly why you want the position and what you could bring to the organisation and really look at the jo job description because that's where the interviewers are going to get their questions from, they're going to question you with. Um, and it can help you prepare. Next slide. And as I said, research who's going to be interviewing you. You could be going into an academic library or a medical library, but as well as having librarians, you could have a clinical or departmental director, a HR director or manager, some sort of consultant, an external advisor. And I'd say probably the best way to, um, to investigate these people is probably looking through Google if you can't find it on their organization websites looking back through Google to find out information because their backgrounds might influence the type of questions you get asked okay
this is me. Uh, so, um, yeah, just going to talk a little bit about the the formats of the interviews. Now, obviously, before 2019, you might have only been offered an in-person interview, but these days a lot of uh, interviews have taken place online. There's different kind of ways that these interviews happen. So I'm just going to talk about, uh, you know, three three of those. So obviously the in-person interview, hopefully you've uh, all, all had one of those and you roughly know how it's going to go down. And we're going to talk a little bit later on about how you might present yourself physically in an in-person interview. But just a, a few kind of um, tips or, or things to think about. So um, one of the things I get asked, uh, you know, as a panel member and also people who are interested in, in interviews is, can I bring notes? to a face-to-face -face interview and um well generally i would say this is fine because most interviewers would say that the interview is not a memory test um so um that that's probably a good idea to to bring notes if you feel like that's something that you might need um but it might be worth asking the panel first um whether that's that's all right with them just as a courtesy um um and uh you could also say um that uh uh one of the important things about, about if you do decide to bring notes and you do sort of create them then uh, don't read from them <laughs> uh so if you do bring them make sure that they are they are notes and they're not just sentences of the questions that you're going to read out um and obviously still take in the question that they give you and and don't just re regurgitate what's what's in front of you uh, the other top tip is uh bring a drink for an in-person interview uh, because as an interviewer i really hate making people cups of tea um and providing like water is just a faff so bring a drink you know be prepared um and um you know you'll you'll you, you'll know where the water's come from then as well so that's just it yeah, top tip. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk a lot more about in-person interviews and sort of you know projecting and presenting yourself in a little bit and how to deal with nerves and all that. So I'll just come on to online interviews. So you know they're they're very different. You're you're um, you're really only presented by this small box here. So uh, in a way, they are a little bit, I think, of a disadvantage to sort of um, uh, if you're a more extroverted person and you you're uh, comfortable in interpersonal situations so you know bear that in mind although they can be an advantage if you're you know potentially a bit shyer and um, you have more control over your your environment in an online interview obviously be aware of what you have behind you uh, in an online interview um, and what you're wearing um, I am wearing trousers at the moment um, but you know, so but you need to need to make sure that you are taking the same care to your appearance for the online interview. The other great advantage from an online interview is you can read from notes, and no one can see that you're reading from notes. So you know that that is something you can deal with uh, a little bit better because you won't be looking down at your paper or your iPad or whatever. You can just read off the screen like I'm doing now. However. A great disadvantage of online interviews is you can read from your notes. So, you know, it is what it is a, a double edged sword, really. So, you really have to uh, make sure that you're going to have a lot of, uh, you, you're going to have the ability to have a lot of information in front of you. Um, but you still need to have that off the cuff conversational I am a person, I'm not a robot, um, and where you can look at the camera. And one of the things you can do to make it seem like you're looking at the camera more is put your notes under the camera on your screen. So you're looking more in that direction. Uh, and if you're one of those people that's tempted to always look at themselves in the camera, you can do that. Because if you look at the difference now, now I'm looking at my camera box in the corner. I'm not getting that eye contact. But if I put my camera box up here, then I'm getting that nice face-to-face -face look so that 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 gives it a real different um appearance when you're doing an online interview and then the last thing i wanted to talk about was multi-part interviews so um i don't think these happen so often in in libraries just because we don't have usually um so many people booked in for interview 
but if you ever do get uh you know if you ever are, are offered like a, a multi-part interview the kinds of things the red flags that should be coming up is if someone says we're going to do a two-part interview or there's day one and day two or perhaps they say oh we, we'd like to have a chat before the interview woo, woo. just bear in mind that that is part of the interview okay so don't uh don't underestimate the casual chat the casual chat is not a casual chat everything every interaction that you have from the confirming of the interview to um any questions that you ask or any uh, questions you ask of the panel in advance um that's all going to reflect on you and even if it's not scored explicitly um you know these things are considered we're all human even if we can't actually score them you know um, panel members will will uh, remember the interactions they've had with you so um so if you are offered a, a, a chat give it full uh, preparation that you would give to a full interview um the kinds of things you might be asked in those initial interviews might be um less specific examples and more general things about about you or maybe your experience um the first part of a multi-part interview might be online or on the phone and it might just be with one of the panel members rather than the whole panel it might also include tests um or any tasks that you'd have to pass before you could potentially be invited to the quote-unquote full full interview so yeah the other thing uh, i would say is uh if you are offered a tour or any kind of like preamble to the interview take it you know take the tour if offered because i would suggest that giving yourself as much faith time with the organization as possible is 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 important um you will have the opportunity to meet potentially other colleagues that you'd be working with and give a good impression on the, them um uh, and also for you it's important to see where you're going to be working if you're thinking oh i might be too nervous to uh to take the tour or i want to prepare i would still recommend taking it because you'll get to see where you are and you'll also be able to meet potentially library assistants and other librarians that you'll be working with and yes obviously you know the tour is part of the interview yeah so uh, if you take the tour you still need to be you know as professional and and um um and uh give it as as much thought as you would the rest of the interview uh next slide please this is me as well so uh yeah gonna just talk a bit about tests and tasks uh so obviously two of the, the two of the people today <laughs> spoke about how how awful we found them uh, but i'm just gonna counter that with with some positives that um hopefully to to uh um kind of balance that a bit so yeah they are dreaded no one likes the tests and the tasks and you know um i think a lot of it comes from the uh, it, because you can prep for them you can start worrying about them you can't worry about the questions necessarily because you don't know what they are yet so a lot of emotional energy goes into the tests and the tasks and that's probably a good thing um, but we'll talk a bit more about that. So what I would say is that tests and tasks, um, the, the best way to think about them is they're an opportunity for you to show a skill or an aptitude that you wouldn't otherwise be able to demonstrate in questioning. So they give um, they give like an extra weight to your overall candidacy as someone who could do the job. And they add depth to you as a candidate. So it, it is important to take them seriously. Obviously, you all do. But there's only so many things that interviewers can ask as part of a, you know, an, uh, an interview. And there's only so many ways that you can demonstrate how you can do the job in, in just answering a question. But when you're given a test or a task, um, you know, they, they are a way to to basically give a lot more um, about yourself or how capable you are in doing the job. Also, they are a way for you to demonstrate you could do the job, even if you have no experience in doing the job. So even if you 
haven't done any teaching or training or anything like that you if you stand up and give a good presentation then you are able to demonstrate that you can can do part of the job description without necessarily having that much that much experience uh, in actually doing it tests allow the interviewers to see how you would handle certain tasks so they're useful for for interviewers as well uh, and they're also an opportunity for interviewers to see how you would cope under pressure under additional pressure so those are the kinds of things that interviewers would be kind of thinking about not just necessarily the content of what you've done in the task or the outcome of the task but but how you approach it um and kind of like how confident you are doing it that kind of thing so usually tests will be adv uh, advertised in advance so you'd get you know you get the, the invite to the interview and um then uh you would uh i don't know if you want to address the stuff that's coming in the in the chat uh yes <laughs> um yes so uh basically um usually they'll be they'll they'll be given to you in advance so especially if you've got to prep something for the test um so however some some tasks will will come on the day and then um, obviously you can't prepare for those so there's not much you can do other than read the job description and think about the things that you might be asked to do can I take the next slide, please? So I did some asking around of um, of uh, colleagues, uh, interview um, people who who do interviews of tests and tasks. Some ones of uh, ones that the, the the panel today have been involved in, and some that I have um, also uh, done myself. And um, so these are the kinds of things that you might expect as a test in the tasks. Obviously, the key one, the main one, is a presentation. Um, and we're not going to have enough time today to talk about all the different kinds of presentation and presentation techniques and, and all of that kind of stuff. There'll be there's lots of information um, out there on, on giving good presentations that you can find. But in terms of, you know, sort of top tips, um, the most important one I would say is, um, you know, putting the content of your presentation aside and, and your slides and all that kind of stuff. Please, please come in on or under time. Nothing an interviewer hates overrunning uh, because they run into the next candidate. They go into our lunch break. <laughs> they they uh, they make us overrun um so really really can't emphasize enough that you come in t in you know if they say it's a five minute presentation make sure it's a five minute presentation practice it make sure you get you hit that five minute mark um and also leave time for questions uh to be asked about your your uh, your presentation afterwards and leave time for you to uh, offer the opportunity of a Q&A after your presentation. Uh, read the brief if the panel is playing a role as part of the uh, presentation. So, you know, quite often in medical libraries, I'll say, oh, we're, we're playing, uh, the panel will play the role of medical students and you're going to give a, like a teaching session to them. Then take that seriously, treat them and the content uh, as if they are medical students, because that that's, you know, doing what you're asked, but also it shows that you can tailor your presentation to different audience groups and of course practice 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 just make sure you practice it uh, there's some others here and we'll just briefly go through those and I'll, then before i hand on to one of my colleagues to take the next part of the presentation but um sometimes you 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 know you might be asked to do a presentation that is a kind of faux induction and um, so that's just a kind of form of presentation really for like students or, or staff um Elevator pictures or lightning talks. If you ever see something like that, then um, this is a, a fast presentation without slides. Um, so um, a more of a test of your interpersonal skills. And the important thing for those is to be engaging and be different and have something memorable in your in your lightning talk. Something that um, that is um, it's more like a sales pitch, really. So you might be asked to sell a, an element of a library service or why people should come to the library service, all these kind of things. Obviously, skills tests, you just got to 
practice these uh, if you are going to do a skills test um, and the kind of things you can do obviously for for those is you know look at organizations like Earl uh, to to practice um, interviews um, if you're if you're going for a job that requires a cataloging test then maybe rethink your life decisions um, just generally um, but uh, if you're perhaps doing literature searching there's lots of material out there on the internet obviously you're gonna your, the, the people on the panel today will also be able to we're more than happy to offer some advice on on these kind of things um, there is no, no substitute for practice when it comes to skills tests role play obviously we've we've spoken a little bit about these uh, as well so you know the best way to think about role play is it's a form of an interview question that you can prepare for if you're going to think about it positively because you'll know that the role play is happening hopefully um, but it's an interview question or a scenario that you or a set of interview questions that you're going to prepare for. Um, so the important thing to remember about role play is obviously it does seem very forced, but do try and play along with it. Um, it's, it is obviously very uncomfortable. Um, one, even if you don't know the answer as part of the role play, um, you know, just use those customer service skills that you all have and be honest and say things like, I don't know the answer to this question, but I will get back to you. I can ask someone that knows, you know, all this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, those those kind of things are are important as part of the role play. And um, I guess, uh, you know, like Hannah's experience, and uh, it, it is it is very uncomfortable. Try to make it as less as least uncomfortable as possible, really. So, you know, obviously. Um, uh it's difficult obviously in the moment to to um to enjoy it but you know uh the best thing to do is just be super positive and 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 go along with it uh analytical tasks so there's just a few here but the kinds of things you might get asked to do or things that people have done in the past is like look through references you know so a student you know is giving you some list of references look through these you know usually the errors are quite obvious um, but those are those are things that might be asked. Mistake spotting is where you might be given something to, uh, you know, like a website a page, and you might be saying, might sort of say, was well, there any errors with this, or what can we do to make it look nicer, that kind of thing. Or for health libraries specifically, you might be given a search strategy and might be asked, you know, for some, um, what if there's any errors in the search strategy. That kind of thing that's a bit more advanced but um if you're going for a searching job you might be asked that for example data manipulation i think these kind of things will be asked more often potentially of uh, candidates in the future so maybe looking at some data and manipulating it in some way um, and this is or potentially summarizing some information to test how you can summarize um potentially something or decision making so you might be asked to look at some usage statistics maybe or some information and you might be asked to provide you know a single best answer on um how you might take uh, something forward so they're all kinds of like possible tests that might come up um and uh, and in the in the the interview um and um yeah hopefully those top tips will uh, help you in the future so I hand over to whoever's next. I think it's me next. It's you, sorry. Yes, yeah. over to you, Hannah. Um, my apologies, everyone, as well, for the mix-up with uh, the instructions in the start time. But, um, yeah, as I've said in chat, um, we are recording and we'll share, send around uh, the slides as well. So hopefully you can catch up. Um so what I'm going to talk about is some of like the softer stuff around interview skills. So um, I think people are quite often uh, quite concerned with like making a good impression um, in interviews, a good first impression. And um, I think the word impression is interesting here because actually uh, I think the thing to bear in mind is when you get invited to interview, quite often already because you've gone through the application process we've selected you to come to an interview we're kind of fairly confident that you've got the skills to do the job 
And part of the interview process is we want to meet you. We want to get a better sense of who you are. So we don't want to, we don't want an impression of who you are. We want to see who you are. So um, it's it's hard because interviews are a very artificial environment. Uh, so of course you are not going to feel like entirely at ease or comfortable. But I think one of my main points that I would try and hammer home is do what you can to kind of be able to feel comfortable in yourself because what we want to do is get a sense of who you are and what it would be like to work with you. Of course, as um, we've already discussed in the section on interview questions, like we, we do want to probe into more of your skills and experience. But at that point, we kind of, you know, it's, it's an add on in terms of what we already know about you from your application. So, um, I think one of the things that people often worry about and what I notice as um, an interviewer is uh, the that people kind of do quite often get quite dressed up for interviews. They get quite like suited and booted, um, which is absolutely fine if that is your jam. If, you know, wearing a suit, wearing smart, formal clothing is both appropriate for the organisation that you're interviewing for, for the kind of role that you're interviewing for. Um, and also if if it's going to kind of make you feel comfortable, for some people wearing this kind of thing, you only wear it for weddings, job interviews and funerals. So you aren't necessarily gonna feel at home in it. So um, I would say there are lots of ways to look smart and presentable without necessarily uh, feeling like you're wearing your mum or dad's clothes. So do have a think about what you can wear that kind of treads the line between that. I think it's also completely acceptable to um, to ask when you're being invited to interview, what's the dress code? What is the dress code for the interview? What is the dress code for the organisation? Because it really, really varies. Um, for And it really varies depending on the kind of organisation or role that you're going for. So, for example, um, my husband works in uh, digital and it is kind of it would be frowned upon to wear a suit to an interview. Um, it's much more casual. Um, and so there's something about, you know, um, Emma, I think you kind of mentioned earlier on about like researching the organisation, um, just kind of like getting it, it kind of gives a sense that you kind of understand the kind of working environment that you're going into. So if you're interviewing for uh, a library job in, say, like the commercial sector, in law, in financial services, you probably do want to dress up a bit more. Um, and in somewhere like health libraries, you know, it's it's not so formal. It's not so strict. Having said that, I have interviewed people who have turned up in jeans and trainers and it's not a deal breaker, but the impression it gives is like, OK, you know, you haven't kind of gone all out for this. <laughs> so giving the impression of making an effort rather than being whatever the idea of like smart is. So yeah, I think it is important to think about, you know, what you are wearing so that you just do feel comfortable and you feel at home in your own skin because what we want is for you to thrive in the interviews. Um, you know, we want to get the best out of you. So whatever will enable you to kind of focus on answering the questions is important so if it's like oh god like this waistband is really digging in this tie makes me feel like I'm choking free up your brain space just wear something that doesn't mean that you're going to think about those things um I think this has kind of been touched upon when we were talking about kind of multi-part interviews as well but all impressions count so uh if you do get invited for a chat if you take the tour side note the tour is I, I think it's important to take the tour just so you can see and get a sense of where you're working. Remember that interviews are just as much for you to get a sense of what this organisation is like, who you're going to be working with. It is it is an assessment of, of them as well as it is for you as well. So remember, it's a two way process. You're figuring out whether this opportunity is right for you. Um, but yes, don't forget that making impression everyone counts. Everyone is deserving of the Hollywood handshake, not just the interview panel. Um, so 
I know this sounds really, really obvious, but making a good impression on everyone you meet in throughout the recruitment process, whether it's virtually like email, uh, like speaking to the kind of HR person who's inviting you to interview, that is all important. I know it sounds obvious, but in my experience of like interviews, it doesn't actually always come across. Um, I've had um, colleagues tell me about uh, interview candidates like they've taken them downstairs in the lift uh, and they've gotten into the lift with a member of uh, the domestic services staff and been incredibly rude to them and that tells you quite a lot about who you are as a person. Um, don't forget that library work quite often is customer facing work, you are dealing with members of the public, you're dealing with your users and that low key is telling you something about how this person is going to interact with your users and are they going to treat them all with respect um, and treat them all equally. So all impressions count. The other thing about showing up at interviews, and this like really resonates with me because uh, I get really nervous at interviews. I am a terrible interviewee. Um, and yeah, Fighting anxiety is one of the major things in interviews um, and being on the other side of the fence, being um, an interview panellist, I, I see this all the time. What I will say is, and I don't know if like others will agree with me, but nerves will not rule you out. It is not a sort of natural situation to be in. It is perfectly natural for you to be nervous. That is OK. You will not get marked down for being nervous. The thing to note about nerves is, are they stopping you from showing up and kind of performing well in the interview? So there is a kind of like thin line. Sometimes nerves can kind of be the, the adrenaline boost that you need um, in an interview situation. Or sometimes they can kind of be paralyzing and kind of make you forget everything that you have remembered. In this case, you know, I think it's a little bit of a case of knowing yourself as well. So if you know that you're really nervous and you think actually having some bullet points down in note form will help you do that. Ask ahead, ask if it's OK to bring your notes, um, whatever helps you to perform the best in an interview. So remember that all of your interview panelists have all interviewed themselves. They all know what it's like to be on the other side of the table. They will have all experienced those nerves. So it's, you know, it is completely natural. The other thing to say is, um, I don't know if this is the same for others when they interview, but quite often the first interview question that I set is an icebreaker. It's, it's not a deal breaker. It's quite often something like, tell us a bit about yourself. Tell us why you're interested in this role. That is just like a nice question to kind of let you settle in in your first five or 10 minutes in your interview um and be get your voice into the room and just get used to the whole situation so remember that it's not completely high stakes from the beginning I mean obviously pay attention to how you're showing up but it's it's not usually the question that will be the deal breaker so just bear that in mind um yeah as I mentioned interviews are on your side we're rooting for you we want you to do well what we ultimately want we ultimately want a good problem at the end of the interview process. We want to have many candidates who are really good and we're like, we can't choose between them. That's what we want. That is like my dream as an interviewer. So don't forget, we're on your side. We will quite often as well, um, you know, if you get a follow up question or a probe, it's sometimes for me as an interviewer, it's because I'm like, I know that you can evidence this better. I know that like from your application, I'm getting a sense that you've got this experience, but you haven't quite given me enough to kind of make me confident that you've got the skills, you've got the experience, or I can get enough of a sense of how you would handle a situation. So if we ask a follow up question, it's, it's because we want to know more. So um, how do you combat nerves? because they are natural. So um, I'm going to ask for a volunteer to participate in an exercise here. Um, so hands up if you would like to participate. <laughs> and I'm fully expecting no one to put their hand up. So if that is the case, I will pick on one of my fellow panellists. So don't worry about it. William, I'm going to go for you. <laughs> 
I knew that was coming. <laughs> uh, yes, sure. Uh, I will raise my hand. Thank you. <laughs> Please tell me how you got to work today and what you had for breakfast. Mm, I had coffee for breakfast uh, and I got to work by uh, cycling a little bit and then I uh, got the train and then when I got to London I did a bit of walking and 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 that was it and now I'm here (laughs) (laughs) excellent thank you (laughs) how did that feel answering that question uh it was fine um but um I appreciate I'm speaking in front of a group of 20 people about what I was doing this morning so (laughs) (laughs) yeah um yeah not too bad yeah how did you feel in your body did you like notice anything that was going on for you well I had to think about because I couldn't remember what was happening this morning because it was seems such a long time ago (laughs) (laughs) um so uh yeah I had to um think and even now I'm starting to stutter which is something I do because I'm not sure what to say (laughs) so (laughs) and then I laugh that's the other thing I do when I don't know what to say (laughs) the thing to buy time (laughs) so all of that stuff is okay you know like when you get caught off guard and even if it's kind of you know in a situation where you're like you're asked a very simple thing uh what you can sometimes notice is is if you're nervous that there are kind of bodily signals that happen uh for me it's like I tend to get like my heart rate goes up a little bit or I get a bit warm um those are my tells if I'm feeling nerves what happens in your body is like whatever your nervous system is whatever your nervous triggers are they tell you your brain they tell your brain that you're nervous but actually your brain might just be like actually no I'm I'm okay I've prepped I've like got my notes I've been prepping for this interview for a week I'm in elasticated trousers everything is good here but because your body is sending these signals suddenly you can kind of start to feel nervous so the important thing is to remember is sometimes your body can lie to you. Um, so I'm just going to share two things that might help. And they work for both online and in-person interviews. Obviously, for an in-person interview, you might need to find a toilet ahead of time to do these things. So uh, my go to thing to kind of shake off the nerves is actually just to physically shake them out. So I know this sounds crazy, sounds a little bit woo woo. But jumping up and down, like shaking your limbs, it just kind of shakes out that adrenaline a bit. Um, The other thing is, uh, yeah, if, like me, you live in a first floor flat with a grumpy downstairs neighbour, maybe jumping isn't isn't a situation that is, you know, going to work for you. So instead, uh, visualise a candle in front of you and try and breathe out without blowing out the flame just keep on doing that and try and kind of bring the heart rate down try not to throw out your teeth like this lady is doing (laughs) those things hopefully might just kind of work to kind of just bring you back to yourself a little bit and shake off those nerves um I can see a question in the chat on have you already discussed um how to answer icebreaker questions Caroline, I don't know if you want to kind of elaborate on that, um, but let's throw this one out to the panel. Um, So to me, like the common icebreaker questions are things like, um, tell us a bit about yourself, tell us why you're interested in this role, or tell us about your career journey to date. Um, For me, quite often, I will have already kind of read this in your application. So for me, it's more just like, get your voice into the room, just get started on getting used to talking to us, making eye contact with us. Um, What do others on the panel think? I think the key with this one is it should kind of be the easiest question because you're being asked to say what your own motivations are most of the time. Um, And I think most places do actually ask this as a first question. So if you're prepping for an interview, absolutely make sure that you have a response 
to this question because we have a, a practice interview scheme at Earl, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, where we talk to lots of different um, recruiters as part of that scheme. And something that pretty much everybody says is they ask this question for some variation of why are you interested in this job? What do you think you could bring to the role? Um, usually is what made you interested in this job as a kind of just starting question. Um, so, you know, be honest about it um, maybe talk about um, the institution that you're applying for, for example. Um, so it, it depends, it partly depends where you are, but like at LSE, for example, we have a very um, exclusive interest in the social sciences, which is pretty unusual. I mean, most other libraries don't have that really laser focus on the social sciences. So a candidate who mentions as an answer to that question that they're interested in the social sciences and that's why they want to work at LSE would really impress me. So think about, you know, where you're interviewing. Um, have a think about the job description and, you know, what it is exactly that interests you. And and also think about, and this is the bit that I think sometimes people forget, and it might be spoken or it might be an unspoken part of the question, but it's why would you be a good fit for the role? So they might ask you this directly, but they might not. But I think they still want to know. Um, so think about the skills and experience that you've had in the past that would help you answer that question basically and then that should take your answer from a uh, sort of standard score to a much higher score if you if you make it clear and just to say you know don't ever say because it pays really well or <laughs> just in case so yeah that would be my experience with that question but for me that icebreaker question is always that you know why do you want this job basically so i think you have to <clears throat> sorry i think you have to weigh up what kind of icebreaker it is is it a genuine free hit icebreaker? As what what Hayes is is sort of saying, you know, where it won't be scored and it really is just a, you know, just to tee you up. Or is it a sneaky first question which actually has a lot of weight? Because if you're asking why do you want the job, that is core to the whole application. If you are asking something like um you know i don't know like how did you get here you know what's your ex uh you know experience so far we already know that it's in the application so that's a free hit mm -hmm. you you just tell us whereas if they're asking why you applied for the job that that's that's deep that's got some deeper meaning in it so um i think it's important to think about that and and just generally taking some time to think uh, before you answer a question is also just a very good top tip so um yeah just <laughs> don't don't have don't feel like you have to immediately uh, answer you can always take a bit of time to to have a think or top tip as well is to just say can you repeat the question or to um you know uh just get buy yourself a bit more time um or do what i do quite often and do a lot of this where you're um saying something but you're not actually saying anything um and then that's time that i'm thinking to think about what i'm going to say next <laughs> which can be very annoying so don't do it too often but um yeah those those are the kind of things that you need to um like do and then you can think of your answer I have been in job interviews as well that at the very end, if you ask a question, when they have you got any questions to ask us, if you ask one, you get a point. So have a question or one or two ready. Always, always ask questions. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it shows that you've researched the role, you know. And, and that you're interested and engaged yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 That so you're not, uh, yeah, you're not not done that and the other thing i was gonna say and i forgot to mention when we're talking about tests um is that there is the possibility that the test is not weighted that highly mm -hmm. so obviously you don't know what the scoring is going to be but you know i'm not going to talk about specific organizations but it could be that the presentation could only be worth the equivalent of one question and so it is essentially 5% or less of the overall interview score. And you're spending so much emotional time and energy on it. And it might not even give you 
any that many points so don't prepare too much for a presentation or a test or a task and neglect having good answers using the star technique like emma suggests um to 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 answer those questions and to prepare for these things because uh, you could end up wasting a lot of of your life preparing for the presentation when it's not actually weighted that highly conversely don't flunk it you know you should still try and do well <laughs> uh because it could be binary it could be like well the presentation is so bad no matter how good the rest of the interview is we, we this person's not the right person for the job but um but you know just yeah keep it balanced thank you everyone and i hope that's been helpful uh to answer your question um so I think I'm handing over to Hannah next and then also Alyssa afterwards, who's going to be talking about feedback. So I don't know which one of you wants to go first. Uh, I think it's I think I'll do talk about the practice interviews. Um, so I think the best way to prepare for an interview is to have an actual practice interview. Um, and basically, Earl does have a practice interview scheme, um, and we developed this in response to feedback from a lot of our members who basically said, you know, this is the worst part of the recruitment process for me. Mm -hmm. This is the thing that makes me feel the most nervous. This is the thing I feel I have the least handle, least for handle on. Um, so we developed the practice interview scheme to give people an opportunity to actually, you know, have a dry run, basically. Um, so we are always looking for interviewees and interviewers to take part in the scheme. So I know the last time we had. Um, when we did the application session, we had quite a few like, recruiters um, and the EARL scheme does actually lack, especially NHS volunteers. So if there's anybody who works in recruitment and wants to volunteer to become a practice interviewer, you would be very, very welcome. Um, but we are also looking for interviewees. So for people who would like to have a little practice interview. And the way we do that is basically so we have a list of um, recruiter volunteers from loads of different organisations. Um, representing you know lots of different specialisms within the sector so like cataloging and copyright and so on um and if you get in touch with us and say that you would like a practice interview we will try and find you two experts for the panel and one earl person um we would draft a kind of job description for you to apply for um we'd send that to you a couple of weeks before the practice interview and then we would basically treat it like a real interview so we'd send you the job description we'd expect you to you know prep based on the job description for questions and answers. Um, and then we will ask you questions in the interview based on that job description and the person's specification. Um, so if you are interested in the, sch the scheme, I do have some kind of top tips. Uh, the first is know what it is you want to apply for. So the most successful practice interviews we have are usually um, kind of redo interviews. So if you've gone for, I don't know, a library assistant customer services position somewhere, you didn't get it. But then you come to us and say, right, I want to do a practice interview for this job description. Um, and then we can then run through that with you. Um, one thing that we have a bit of a uh, difficulty with is that people can sometimes be quite vague when they sign up to the schemes. They might say, oh, I'm interested in inquiries, but I'm interested in a bit of copyright work. And, and when people like change their mind and things, if we're going to do a practice interview, it has to be for a specific role. We can't do like a sort of generic interview practice. It just doesn't work. It's just impossible to put an interview together for that. So before you apply, um, and there is um, at that link I've included there, and I'll pop one in the chat as well. Um, there is like a sort of survey that we ask you to fill in, asking, you know, when you would like to interview and what you'd be looking for. So just have a think beforehand about what exactly it is, you know, what are you interested in? What kind of jobs are you applying for day to day? What kind of roles? Um, once we once you've signed up, please keep in touch. <laughs> uh, it's a little bit of a difficult process sometimes because we we basically get in touch with two experts and we put together an interview panel with them so once we've done that if the person who wants the practice interview stops replying to us when we get back to them to offer them the actual interview that's embarrassing from our point of view so if you're going to sign up please do be determined to do the interview so again it's it's something um to think about don't be scared we really do place an emphasis on being a friendly panel all our interviews are online as well so i think that helps a little bit um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll be as friendly as possible. You know, if you have a problem with turning up into interviews and freezing and being scared, it doesn't count. It's not a real interview. Just bear that in mind. Um, we can't offer interviews for live vacancies. 
Um, so we decided to stop doing this because we have so many different um, representatives from different institutions. And if they were involved in active recruitment at the time we were doing practice interviews, we, it, it represents too much of a conflict of interest. So unfortunately, we can't do interviews for live vacancies. But if you have previously applied for a job and you want to redo the interview, that's not a problem. That would be great. Um, we can have a go at tests. They're very difficult because everywhere has a different kind of test. So coming up with a, a generic test for a, a customer services interview or something like that can be quite difficult. We can try, but we make no promises because obviously tests, they're so different everywhere and people are looking for different things out of them. And, you know, as William was saying, the, the weighting on the marking and how important they are is different as well. Um, so we can't always guarantee to kind of know if they say oh, we're going to do a literature searching test what exactly would be involved in that test but we could give it a try we'd give it a shot at the very least we could go to the panelists and say if you were doing this test what would you be looking for what would be most important to you um so yeah i've mentioned that you get a job description at least a week to prepare we'll try and do a panel with um three of our expert recruiters and one earl member um and then finally we do provide full and extensive feedback and this is one of the real advantages of the program i think because you get much more extensive feedback from us than you do from a normal job interview. And I think part of the reason for that is that there's no HR department involved. So we can be completely honest. We can cover absolutely every aspect of the interview. What we usually try and do is we'll give you the questions, show you how you scored, and then give you tips on each question about what you could have said to have made it better. I mean, the last one we did was for an NHS post actually. And um, I think they got four pages of interview feedback, which is, I think a lot more than you'd get at most places. So that's one of the most valuable things we do. Um, do you offer, so I've got a question in the chat. Do you offer interviews that include presentations? We haven't done one so far. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is ones that include presentations are often at like a slightly higher grade than Earl typically deals with. But if you are in a situation where you need to give a presentation or an interview, um, then we could. Um, have a look at that basically if you let us know what the presentation is um we could see if we could get some people together to, to view the presentation and give you some tips but again it's, it's a similar thing with the tests where you don't necessarily know what they're looking for ahead of time um so yeah we can do presentations but it, it kind of depends on context really um, and i've just popped the link in the chat as well and as we were talking about feedback i think we're moving on to Alyssa. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. Um, I think you can also remove the slides. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words about feedback, um, which sadly, usually you only get when you don't get the job. But obviously, more often than not, that will probably be the case. Um, so yeah, feedback. Um, maybe first of all, uh, once again, if you can get the take it um as i mentioned earlier on i just i went to many different recruitment processes um and sometimes was offered feedback um sometimes not um in different formats as well so i've had um phone calls as feedback which that was very useful we was able to actually ask questions when I wasn't sure. Um, I really understood what people were getting at. Uh, and then obviously more often than not, you just get a couple of lines of feedback in an email. Um, yeah, but what I really want to say is that with the feedback, obviously this, you just got rejected from a job. This is, I guess, the moment where you can step back take some time to reflect um and i think most importantly be kind to yourself um it's a really hard and not fun process and can often seem not fair not easy um obviously everyone's trying to do their best but um i think most of us have gone to really um complicated bureaucratic <laughs> recruitment processes uh which just aren't um yeah a lot of fun so um yeah really take this time around the feedback um for yourself 
Um, in terms of the feedback itself, um, I have found personally that the most useful feedback uh, has been when I was really well prepared for the interview in the first place. So for interviews that I went in, maybe not ideally prepared, I often found the feedback quite, yeah, super special, not that obvious. Oftentimes I was just like, yeah, of course I should have done that. Um, so yeah, the better prepared, the more useful the feedback is. Um, so I think just generally speaking, the experience of the interview will be better if you feel well prepared. And yeah, then feedback will also feel better, more useful. The second point that I wanted to make is to always take it with a grain of salt as well. So while often I have found it quite useful, um, I've gotten use, uh, feedback that didn't really match the do job description. So the job description put a lot of emphasis on one thing and then in the feedback you'd get <laughs> feedback was like, why didn't you talk about this? Um, so yeah, once again, be kind to yourself. <laughs> um, and then obviously no job, two jobs um, um, require the same skill sets, same, uh, have the same requirements. So um, the feedback can sometimes be a bit limited. Uh, but that being said, um, I think, yeah, I have found it overall quite helpful. And often you might also get really good feedback which can be a bit annoying as well and I think yeah let yourself feel that as well <laughs> yeah let yourself uh feel annoyed <laughs> uh because you might get really good feedback but not get the job and you're like why <laughs> um but then uh I guess at least in the medium term it actually can feel really good to know that you've done a couple of really good interviews and we're really close and then the third interview you do might be the one where you don't actually get the job. Um, so yeah, that was um, what I had to say. I'm quickly gonna put a pop in the chat, a report by NeuroSpicy Libraries, which have recently published a report about recruitment and interviews from like a neurodivergent librarian's perspective. So that might be interesting. I think they published it a couple of weeks ago. So still um, hot off the press. Um, but I think that being said, I'd open up in the final discussion. If anyone has questions, um, feel free to either raise your hand uh, or put them in the chat. Um, and I'm sure everyone would be happy to respond. You know, one of one thing that you just dropped my memory and um, when you were talking about feedback um that I find quite useful is to take a notebook with you. You don't necessarily have to have it with you in the interview, but have it in your bag or something. And then as soon as you get out of the interview, try and write down as many questions as you can actually remember, especially if you've got a difficult question that really tripped you up. I know it's not what you want to do. It's like getting out of the exam and then everybody's discussing what they've put and you're like, oh no, I don't want to think about it anymore. That was always my attitude anyway. Um, but it is enormously helpful because remembering the exact questions and, and, and being able to look back <laughs> at a question that tripped you up um, will help you so much for the next interview. And, you know, you don't need to wait on feedback. It's, it's something you can do right away to make you feel in control. So I, I just made me think of it when you talk about feedback, Alyssa. Um, it's something that's helped me a lot in the past. So, yeah, I think that's such a good point. I think more often than not, I have found just now that the things that I picked up myself as a because often you are you're giving an answer to a question but at the back of your mind you're like oh this is not what I really want to say but I just can't come up with anything better and then to like come out of the interview and then immediately as you're saying write down the question that tripped you up um and then think about what you might be able to say next time is what really helped me yeah Think, do we have a question what's a reasonable time to wait for an answer after an interview before you check good question 
I would say that this is, uh, so we've talked about kind of asking questions at the end of interviews. This is one of the most commonly asked questions that we get asked at the end of the interview. I think it's an entirely reasonable question to know how long, like, so, you know, when when should I expect to hear, for example? Um, it's a great question. Um, show us that you're interested. And also, you know, it gives you a bit of peace of mind so that, you know, like, if they said a week, then, you know, you can feel a bit more comfortable to chase um, if you haven't heard from them in over a week. Yeah, I I, I agree. I think um, it, the, the, the key thing is to try and do it in the interview. Um, try and ask in the interview when they will, when you will be able to find out, which gives you that yardstick where you can then follow up after. Mm -hmm. But um, just based on pre based on my own personal experience, um, in times that I have been in an interview panel, I mean, we we uh, I we do our best to make the decision that day or in the mm -hmm. following day, so we probably know quite soon. Um, but what, what's often the case is we have to contact everyone and there's like HR processes that slow things down. So, um, it, it is a case of, uh, I would generally say like a week is, is, is not unreasonable to just say yeah. hi. Yeah. But, um, we do our very, very best to let people know like as soon as possible. It's just not always the case that, that, um, that, uh, that, that, that happens. Yeah. habit of babbling in interviews okay yeah I think if you're a babbler uh try to um introduce into your talking some pauses <laughs> that was that was gonna be my suggestion <laughs> Slow it down. Um, Slow it way down. I, yeah. I am also a bubbler. Um, and the way that I try to get around it is to try and consciously slow down how fast I talk because sometimes it's, I mean, sometimes people bubble as a way of like, I'm one of these people that kind of like, you know, processes stuff as I say it. So quite often, you know, you start talking and it can come out as a bit of a bubble, but then it segues into something valuable. <laughs> um, but also like, yeah prepping and also slowing yourself down so I think sometimes babbling is a response is a nervous response to kind of like not 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 feeling prepared um but yes uh yeah consciously slowing yourself down if uh, I think someone said this earlier if you need time before answering a question just just say that say like oh like good question uh yeah. let me just have a think about it uh take a deep breath yeah maybe also I definitely do that all of the time um if you take a bit of time write down maybe three key points that you want to touch on and you answer and then once you've covered those yeah I mean even stop even don't have to write them down just say them yeah just say them out loud say mm -hmm. so they've asked you about your previous experience well I want to talk about three bits of previous experience a, B, C, and then you've got a framework of what you're going to waffle on about. Um, so yeah, in terms of yeah waffling, the other thing is, again, when you're practicing answering interview questions, um, the best thing to do is to have your phone or whatever, stopwatch, whatever, and just time yourself. Because there's how many questions can you be asked that are going to be longer? The answers are going to be longer than the thirty seconds. Let's be honest, the thirty seconds a minute, whatever. Uh, limit you want to put on it but you need to have this kind of internal metronome in your head that says oh actually that's the end of my talking time now to stop yourself from waffling <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah there's also a follow-up question about waffling oh sorry um i was just going to say sorry jennifer i was just going to say it it's also okay to stop after you think you've asked answered the question so like i think sometimes I've caught myself doing that just like run on after you've answered the question it's okay to just kind of be like okay that that's it I'm done <laughs> you can you can say if it makes you feel better you can say at the end like and that's what I think or you know or if you want yeah. if, you, if, if, if it makes you feels better to say like that's the that's the finish you just have some words that you can use like 
um and so that's how i did this full stop you know so yeah there's never question it's like i've been lucky mostly and most of the interview words i've had have proactively answered my questions in the summary or otherwise during the interview itself uh is it okay to say things say things like thank you you've answered all my questions i have prepared uh, would you be open to follow up questions after the interview? Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely fine, Melanie. Yeah, um, I think um, it's always t totally fine to send uh, questions after the interview. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I wouldn't have a. I'd be quite happy to do that as well. What Obviously, are some... Please, please. please. <laughs> you didn't get the job. Um, this Beverly, is really tough. Beverly, in 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 the in the in the interview or or like after, <laughs> because the thing is like in the interview, right? Or like while the interview is going on, we may not have seen all the candidates. So there is no uh, there is no way you can tell from the interview that you have got the job or you have not got the job because we've not seen everyone that that is uh that is going to be interviewed so it's not it's not possible to say you you could have given the interview of your life and smashed it out of the park but someone else did the same you know so it's not you it's it's just you know that's how it is yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I would not even I would not even attempt to go down this road as well mm -hmm. to try and look for clues in the interview of whether you've got it or not. Firstly, as William says, that decision hasn't been made yet. Um, so, and if you're just looking for clues that it's not going well, that's not what you want to be focusing on in the interview. And I also don't think you can guess. I mean, you might get out of the interview and think, "Oh, I don't think that went very well." We've all had those interviews, but I don't think you can because you don't know the panel I mean if you can look at someone and think oh they look very frowny and that means it's not going well but they might be like that you know? <laughs> and the opposite way around I mean some now you know people are very friendly in the interview and you can that you can take that the wrong way as well and you can think I'm doing really well and they're just nice yeah <laughs> <laughs> I think um what Melissa was saying about doing that instant reflection I don't know if it was Alyssa or Hannah, where you, you come out of the interview and you and you do that instant reflection about how it went. Um, obviously, that's good for future interviews and all that kind of stuff. But um, the other thing that it's useful for is if you're one of these people that worries um, and the, the, the experience of the interview is going to stick with you mentally for several days afterwards because you, you find it quite overwhelming or, you know, it's a lot to take in doing that uh, instant reflection of what you were asked and how well each question went and however you do that, whether you record yourself or uh, like a voice note or whether you write it down or whatever, but doing that can help you, um, can help you kind of process what, what what's happened. Um, so if you, I don't know, I'm not saying that you, you, that you're a worrier, Beverly, but, but yeah, that doing that might, might help you sort of put it to one side let's say and then because once the interview is done or during during the interview you still have a chance to make a difference but once the interview is done that's it you you you've done the best you can uh so you know um try it's still easy to say but try not to worry about it afterwards <laughs> i agree and i think it's like you know I don't think you should be trying to kind of like during the interview process look for where you're going wrong um try to be in a bit more of a positive affirmative frame of mind because like it's a difficult enough situation don't make it hard of yourself you know yeah be your own cheerleader <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so you know I, I don't think there are any tells but also I, I think it's it's I think you should free up your brain space to just answer the questions well that's ultimately what what we're looking for really is a really good sense from the answers of how you would handle yourself in a particular situation what your experience is that kind of stuff you're on mute Hannah 
I am on mute, thank you. Um, I think we're nearly done. Um, we've got a minute or so. If anyone wants to drop any last questions in, um, let us know now. But otherwise, I think, yeah, I can't see anything in the q and Yeah, that brings it to a close. So thank you everybody for coming. I hope you found it a useful session. Um, we've certainly enjoyed doing these recruitment workshops um, and we really enjoyed talking to you all and, and hearing your questions. Um, the recording will be made available upon YouTube. Um, so for those of you who missed the first part of the session, please do go and check it out um, and, you know, go back, revise it again, have another look. Um, and yeah, I mean, personally, if anyone wants to follow up with me with any questions or anything, feel free. And if interviews are a real pain point for you, then please do sign up to that practice interview scheme because we'll we'll try and do our best to, to help you with that. Okay. Thank you, everyone, and good luck. We hope to see you in uh, in our interview room soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Good luck. <laughs>